The CCJ hears arguments on historic advisory opinion. The community assesses strides towards digital transformation. Education ministers meet in Georgetown, Guyana. CARICOM explores ways to reduce gender-based violence. Welcome to this week's edition of CARICOM News Time. I am Michelle Nurse with the details of these and other stories. Can a member state of CARICOM lawfully opt out of a decision by CARICOM heads of government to expand the classes of persons who are entitled to work and move freely throughout the region? That's a question that has been put before the Caribbean Court of Justice, the CCJ, for an advisory opinion, the first filed at the CCJ in its original jurisdiction. The proceedings were held on the 22nd and 23rd of October. They were concerned with whether a member state, pursuant to Article 27.4 of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, can lawfully opt out of a decision of the Conference of the Heads of Government taken under Article 46.4 on the expansion of classes of persons entitled to work and move freely in the community. The proceedings also heard arguments on whether the nationals of those member states which opt out of a decision can nevertheless derive the benefits of the decision. General Counsel at the CARICOM Secretariat, Dr. Corlita Bob Schaefer, said that the proceedings are to determine legal certainty. Yesterday, Your Honor said, in response to my learned friend from Barbados referring to a 2006 decision, can we use precedents where participants do not regard them as legally binding? And I would like to clarify that the request for the advisory opinion should not be understood as the conference not regarding the previous decisions as legally binding. As your honors are aware, although the conference remains the supreme organ of the community, and the member states are the same, the heads at the table change, and the legal advisors change, and the institutional memory is not always present. The conference is of the view that on balance, it acted lawfully, but for legal certainty, this matter is before this honorable court. Among those appearing before the court on Tuesday were representatives from Barbados, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua and Barbuda, and the University of the West Indies. Rights and obligations under the Treaty of Chagaramas and the consequences arising from a member state opting out of an obligation were raised during the hearings. Reciprocity, human rights, timelines, and prejudice were among the other matters on which arguments were presented. The state of Antigua and Barbuda accepts the submissions of St. Kitts and Nevis, Grenada, and the Amicus Curai of the University of the West Indies that Article 27.4 of the revised treaty is silent in respect as to what are the consequences when a member state opts out from an obligation arising from the decision of the conference. Consequently, it is accepted that the true interpretation of Article 27.4 suggests that a member state who opts out from an obligation arising from the decision of the conference should be able to derive the benefits as the other member states are bound by the obligations of the decision of the conference. However, it is respectfully submitted, notwithstanding this foregoing, that this does not exclude the point that the principle of non-reciprocity should not apply where a member state has been granted an opt-out of a decision of the conference pursuant to Article 46 of the revised treaty. It is further submitted that the Article 27.4 is prefaced by the words subject to the agreement of the conference 
and this denote that a member state's decision to opt out of the obligation arising from the decision of the conference is contingent on the agreement. It therefore follows that the conference in the agreement should set out guidelines and or framework which would include the applicability or the non-applicability of the principle of the non-reciprocity for all member states as it relates to the member state who opts out of an ab obligation arising from the decision of the conference. First of all, we would just like to state that the principle of reciprocity in our view applies to Article 27.4 of the RTC, at least in respect of obligations concerning the rights of establishment and the provision of services which presume of necessity the right of movement of community nationals. Such a view is also posited by the state of Antigua and Barbuda, the UE Mona Campus Amicus Curiae, who unfortunately isn't here today, and the Caribbean community. We also feel that there is no need for there to be an express statement with regard to reciprocity when the conference makes a decision to grant an opt-out to a member state under Article 27.4 of the RTC. Once again, we'd like to stress that the RTC, in our view, is not a humanitarian treaty, and therefore the principle of non-reciprocity does not apply. There is no substantive implication that the principle of non-reciprocity applies to the provisions of the RTC. The member states that have been granted an opt-out are primarily also OECS member states. The OECS provides for the movement of its nationals without any official certificate of recognition under the revised treaty of Bastyr. And the other point we wanted to just reiterate is that there is insufficient data to, on which to establish legal precedent that member states who have opted out are still allowed to derive the benefits of the decision from non-opting out member states. And in any event, as was said yesterday, data that would be applicable would be from non-OECS member states. We are just to make a few comments with respect to whether the Article 27 procedure relates to obligations and or if it, if it relates to rights. Now, in the most concise manner that I can put it, when a state opts out via Article 27.4, the opting out state is not required to comply with particular obligations. When the conference agrees to that opt-out, what the conference in turn does, that decision affects the rights of members, of, of nationals of other member states. So in other words, we have one state is not required, the optional state is not required to follow obligations, but the rights of nationals of other states are affected. So, for instance, if I was from Barbados, I would not be permitted to go to St. and Nevis as a security guard because I don't, they have opted out of those specific provisions. Now, keep in mind that that is what actually happens when one state decides to opt out and the conference decides to permit that state to opt out. We submit it as reasonable for the conference to in turn set parameters within which the opting out must take place. Of course, I think the question that was raised recently is, does the conference have that power to impose restrictions of that nature via Article 27.4? And though Article 27.4 does not state that the conference has such a power, the functions of the conference from Article 12, we see it is to determine the policy directions of the community. And one of the key things that the conference does, it makes decisions, which in turn is how the provisions of the RTC are brought into force. It is those very decisions of the conference itself 
that sets obligations on member states to comply with various aspects of the RTC to bring them to fruition. So in the absence of the conference being able to make these decisions, and Article 27.4 requires it to make a decision in terms of whether or not to opt out, we submit that it is quite viable for them to impose parameters when it determines whether to grant an Article 27 opt out. President of the court, Justice Adrian Saunders, said that the opinion will be given within a reasonable time. Well, I wish to thank all counsel for their efforts, um, their submissions. Um, we are going to consider all of them, of course. And I wouldn't be able to give you a time now when we would give the decision, but I could tell you that it would be given within a reasonable time. The CCJ was inaugurated in 2005 in Trinidad and Tobago, where it is headquartered. Its central role is providing legal certainty to the operations of the CARICOM single market and economy, the CSME. It is structured to have two jurisdictions, an original and an appellate. In its original jurisdiction, it ensures uniform interpretation and application of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. As the final Court of Appeal for Member States of the Caribbean Community, it fosters the development of an indigenous Caribbean jurisprudence. You can listen to the recordings of the proceedings on the YouTube channel of the Caribbean Court of Justice and on the CARICOM news site, today.caricom.org. From aspiration to action, the region's education ministers and representatives of educational institutions made this their rallying cry as they met over the past week to put flesh to the CARICOM Human Resource Development Strategy 2030. The strategy provides a roadmap for joint action by CARICOM member states in education and training to unlock Caribbean human potential. Director of the Human and Social Development Directorate at the CARICOM Secretariat, Ms. Helen Royer, told CARICOM Newstime that the ministers and associates focused heavily on measures to accelerate implementation. I must say, from deliberations for, for the two days, some we had around 17 items um, submitted for the consideration of the ministers of education. and. Um, we had very robust discussions and some of the, I will just refer to some of the main areas that were highlighted. One of this, um, the main highlights is that we had a, a baseline report submitted to the heads on the key indicators to address the both the access, the four priorities that I alluded to before, access, relevance, equity, quality, in reference to both basic education, skills for lifelong learning, and tertiary education. They also provided, it was against a, a survey that was conducted in member states to identify their status, the status of member states in or their readiness to respond to key indicators, especially as it relates to monitoring and evaluation. So we had the findings, the findings were submitted and discussed, and um, in reference to to the um, access, relevance, qual um, qual qual quality and equality, um, the ministers had the opportunity to discuss and um, determine whether the targets that were set for the region, whether they were feasible, whether they were achievable. You can get Ms. Royer's full summary of the meeting on our YouTube channel. And several ministers highlighted some of the key measures addressed during their two-day meeting, which will advance the human development thrust. Guyana's Education Minister, Dr. the Honorable Nicolette Henry, stressed the importance of ICT to 21st century education. I'm of the firm view that ICT underpins a lot of what 21st century education should be. Because, um, it, it forms the basis of understanding a lot of the modern um, needs that have to be met, the way things are done, and so it must be taught in the classroom. Every child 
should have access to that. Like how we do literacy and numeracy. This, is, this has become that of today. And so I think we have to ensure that whatever we do in the education sector captures that need. Because we are preparing our young people for jobs that we don't even quite know what they would look like maybe a decade from now. Her Suriname counterpart, the Honorable Lillian Ferrier, also praised efforts to integrate a revised CARICOM Health and Family Life curriculum into the regular school curriculum. All the time it was something set apart and not integrated, not an integrated part of the curriculum. So for children to understand and to really um, develop the competency we want from that HFLE uh, curriculum, it's very important that this curriculum is integrated in our normal school curriculum. In Suriname, we are doing that now, right now. Education Minister of the British Virgin Islands, Dr. the Honorable Natalio Weathley, welcomed the attention being given to regional teaching standards, noting that it is already very relevant to his country, which sources teachers from across the Caribbean. In the BVI, uh, we are going through the process of really setting standards in the education system. And certainly um, standards across the region are useful for us because we employ teachers from across the Caribbean region and even beyond. So it's important for us to have uh, common standards across the region that we can rely on and ensure that uh, when teachers travel from elsewhere that you know, there, there's the same quality across the board that you can rely on among all the member states. And even a means of being able to measure um, the effectiveness of a teacher is important. At the start of the meeting on Wednesday, CARICOM Secretary General Ambassador Erwin LaRock stressed the importance of action if the region is to build a globally competitive, innovative, and seamlessly integrated education system to drive inclusive, sustainable development. The key now is taking action, and I repeat action, to realize the vision of the HRD 2030 strategy. This 38th meeting of the COSOD is then aptly themed, moving from vision to action. The issues to be discussed illustrate in concrete terms the actions needed at the level of member states and the CARICOM Secretariat, and I dare say by some of our regional institutions, if the aspirations for Caribbean human potential are to be realized. This council is asked to seek consensus and articulate concrete actions on a number of issues, including, and I'll only highlight three. One, the need for a holistic response to the implementation of the HRD strategy, which requires increased and deep, deepened interconnectivity between regional and national agencies. It calls for the promotion of shared responsibility and ownership for the vision of the strategy. Two, active leadership at all levels to ensure sustainability for the innovative institutional mechanisms needed in member states and regionally to be implemented, enforced, and monitored for impact. And three, the need to critically examine at the local and regional levels the barriers that stymie quality educational delivery and human capital development at all levels of the education system. Also speaking at the opening ceremony, Assistant Secretary General for Human and Social Development, Dr. Douglas Slater, stressed the importance of teaching standards and conceptualizing the Caribbean's new school model. While all the agenda items before us are important, there is need to encourage increased attention to the CARICOM draft standards for the teaching profession and the typology of Caribbean new school model. These agenda items will provide a framework to engender strategic positioning of the education system to address the many challenges that confront our region. The role of the CARICOM single ICT space in the region's pathway to digital transformation will be one of the key areas of discussion when ministers with responsibility for technology meet early next month. The ministers gather on the 8th of November 
for a special meeting of the Council for Trade and Economic Development on Information and Communication Technology. I spoke with Ms. Jennifer Britton, Deputy Program Manager, Information and Communication Technology for Development at the CARICOM Secretariat on expectations from the meeting. We have moved on as a world to uh, what is now being called digital transformation. So we examined at the officials meeting some issues which uh, either beset us or benefit us as a region with regard to digital transformation, examined some possible projects. And in the space of looking at digital transformation, obviously we have to bring in our own uh, single ICT space. So we looked again at how the uh, Elements that are envisaged for the single ICT space support the region in digital transformation. What is going to be going before the ministers are some uh, priority projects that we think would cause the region to move forward with digital uh, transformation in 2020 and 2021. And additionally, looking at some of the critical uh, pillars of digital transformation, such as skills, digital skills, looking at how we become cyber resilient as opposed to only chasing after cyber security. I think we are sometimes hard on ourselves as a region, but that doesn't mean that we should be too soft as well. We are at a place where as a region we are with uh, reflecting 35% internet penetration, which is not bad, taking other uh, developing countries by, as, on a one-to-one -one basis. So as a collective, we are not doing too badly. I think the fact that the word single ICT space has been in our ether for quite a while, people are beginning to get impatient, but in fact, we only got the um, agreement from heads in 2017. So I think we're keeping pace. But the fact that we also um, gave ourselves an ambitious target of 20 2022 for uh, seeing some key elements means that we have to start moving very quickly. Gender in the ICT sector is also a matter that will be discussed. Gender is a bigger issue for me in the, re in, this, in the sector because we do not have a lot of women at the what we call the C-suite level. A number of us continue to ruminate at the middle management level and so you don't have, I think and it's one of the things that is negating the development of the region, we don't have a lot of women in ICT in the actually decision making space. Huh? The other thing that is going to be profiling is that we're looking at a program in 2020 which looks at girls in ICT but we're also going to be looking at boys because we don't yet have a dis um, we don't yet have data on whether or not it is our boys who are marginalized in ICT or our girls. There are quite a lot of girls in ICT, but they stay in the uh, middle management type jobs where they can go home at 4:30. They're not in the actual IT department or in analysis or that type of thing. So there is a gender issue, and it is a good uh, topical issue for the whole region, I think, to engage around. So that is one of the things that we'll be taking to ministers as well. How do we want to uh, position ourselves as ICT practitioners in the whole digital skills and future of work uh, discussion that's going on all across the world? In preparation for the ministerial session, ICT officials met Tuesday, the 22nd of October, via video conference anchored right here at the CARICOM Secretariat. The CARICOM Secretariat on Tuesday, the 22nd of October, hosted an inception meeting for partners in the new multi-million dollar Global Fund grant. The grant should help reduce human rights related barriers to HIV services and community responses and systems for key populations in the region. Ms. Shellon Boville is the project coordinator at the CARICOM Secretariat, the principal recipient for the fund. The CARICOM Secretariat is the principal recipient. We will manage, coordinate and provide oversight to the implementation of the project over the next three years. The project started the 1st October 2019 and run for three years until September 30th, 2022. The new grant will work to build sustainability of services in 10 countries which benefited from an earlier grant. They are Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Cuba, Belize, the Dominican Republic, Guyana, Haiti, Jamaica, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago.
So the first grant, and that's the previous grant that ended 30th September 2019, spoke to the removing of barriers, or the removal of barriers that impede access uh, of uh, key populations to services. This grant deals par particularly with sustainability of programs. So we want to really see sustainable efforts towards prevention, care, and treatment services as we respond to HIV regionally. It's a multi-country grant, however, we are engaging 10 member states in the process of sustaining our approaches to HIV in the region. Uh, $6.5 million a Global Fund has provided that has been divided amongst our implementing agencies and the principal recipient in this process. The Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV AIDS, PANCAP, is one of the three sub-recipients with which the Secretariat, as principal recipient, will work. Its executive director was part of Tuesday's inception meeting. It's critical to understand that we are currently challenged in relation to a significant reduction of external donor funding. And this really challenges us to advocate with our member states to increase domestic resources for HIV response, particularly to ensure that those resources are also allocated for key population groups, including men who have sex with men, transgendered persons, sex workers, persons who use drugs, youth. And the PANCAP coordinating unit, which is one of the owners of the grant, because you would have heard about CVC and COIN, the three regional organizations submitted this grant as a consortium. So we are the owners of the grant. PANCAP in particular would be responsible for the high-level advocacy, particularly with Ministers of Finance, Ministers of Health, for the increase in domestic resources, particularly to focus on key population groups and to sustain the, the response in relation to those groups to ensure that they continue to have access to prevention, treatment, care and support services. PANCAP will be joined by the Caribbean Vulnerable Communities Coalition, which was represented at the inception meeting by its executive director, Mr. Ivan Cruikshank. The grant will focus on a number of areas. One, it will seek to do things like helping to build the capacity of civil society to strengthen their own efforts of sustainability. It will include things like um, resource mobilization, mapping of resources, um, and identification of opportunities for strengthening their um, internal systems for things like social contracting, which is a new and emerging area of our work. We will continue to provide uh, resources towards the type of um, community responses to stigma and discrimination that we are currently supporting under the existing grant. So we will continue to have our community paralegal programs. We will continue to invest some of the resources that are there into um, programs geared towards addressing gender-based violence, ensuring that labs are sustainable and labs are addressing the needs of key population groups. The Dominican Republic-based group COIN is the third sub-recipient and Representative Vanessa Rosario says their outreach will also extend to neighboring countries. We are working at the same objectives with the organization, cyber organizations and we are working with one sub-recipient -sub different like CNSX from Cuba and we are working with Haiti. The CARICOM Secretariat, with support from the European Union, is working assiduously to address negative manifestations of masculinity that are attributed to gender-based violence. The European Union's support has allowed the CARICOM Secretariat to facilitate robust discussions which have interrogated gender stereotypes and inequalities in Jamaica, Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago. The discussion moved to Belize last week among primary, secondary and tertiary educators, representatives of faith-based and non-governmental organizations, as well as social and correctional institutions.
Speakers at the opening ceremony all emphasized the urgent need to address negative and distorted views of masculinity in the process of ending gender-based violence. Ms. Anne-Marie Williams, Deputy Program Manager for Gender and Development at the CARICOM Secretariat, said the workshops are tailored to strengthen relationships between male and female students in schools and in the wider society. These workshops titled Rethinking Masculinity, Understanding Gender Equality as a Means of Ending Violence in Caribbean Schools are tailored to improve and where possible strengthen the relationship between male and female students in schools and in the wider society by equipping them with a battery of soft skills that males are not typically socializing because they're seen as diametrically opposed to the kinds of masculinity practice. And over the next two days, we have two regional experts, Professor Barbara Baby and Dr. Peter Well, to make sure that you leave here looking and rethinking masculinity. Minister with Portfolio Responsibility for Gender Issues in Belize, the Honorable Anthony Martinez, in his address said Belize was pleased to be one of the pilot countries for this important discourse. The truth is that in small developing countries like ours, we can ill afford gender inequality. We have a small population and if we are to achieve our national development goals, we need to be firing on all civilians. As it relates to violence, we are all interconnected, and so all negative impacted by violence, whether it is within school, within the home, or in the community. Our children deserve to go and try in a peaceful society, and so we need to confront the root causes of violence head on. And certainly, Distorted ideas of manhood are one of them. So, ladies and gentlemen, to my mind, this workshop is very important. It's a very important one. It's very, very much complements our ongoing effort in violence prevention and achieving gender. Thank you for this very important initiative. Mr. Nicholas Hansman team leader of the EU's technical office in Belize, told the meeting that his organization is very proud to support the initiative through the 10th EDF. I think this workshop, uh, from the European Union's point of view, is a very good initiative on the regional level, brought down to the countries in these sort of workshops, and um, I also appreciate that uh, the National Women's Commission is involved and that this will apparently have effects in the school and in the schools and to work with young boys to start preparing them for hopefully their new role in society and family. So finally, we support this uh, workshop and these initiatives and their advocacy for better understanding and rethinking of masculinity <coughs> and gender. The Minister of Education, Youth, Sports and Culture of Belize, the Honorable Patrick Faber, also fully endorsed the initiative. Sure, we could do all the policing, we could equip the police with body cams, we could put surveillance cameras on every other street, street corner, we could increase the uh, amount of vehicles and guns and everything else that we give to the police, but the answer in fighting crime and violence, which is probably the biggest problem that we have in the Belizean society, is by attacking the root cause. And one such root cause is our neglect or our continued misunderstanding and, and negatively looking at masculinity. All the problems that we've described, and I went through many of them just now, any of these problems that we have in crime and violence, which is mainly, I think, perpet perpetuated by our young males, if we fix those problems, we will be effectively fixing the problem of crime and violence. If our young men are not afraid 
of taking on their responsibilities, if they get an equal opportunity at education, if they do well at education, if they are equal partners in terms of qualifications with their counterpart females in the home, they won't need to feel less of a man to go up and make a living. They won't need to go out there and to seek attention from the gangs and seek support and comfort from the gangs. They will be in their family structures comfortably. All of these problems that we know plague us would have been solved. And it's not utopia. The answer to it, the answer to how we solve it, my friends, I write it in this room as I look at players here. The opening ceremony was enlivened with a cultural presentation by Belize's Wesley College, featuring wind and percussion instruments and Garifuna drums and dance. stories, visit the CARICOM website at www.caricom.org or the CARICOM news site at today.caricom.org. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you next time.